So in this video, we're going to revisit a concept that we've already seen before, which is a register. But we want to talk about a special kind of register called a load register. Basically, the problem is this. The registers that we have been using and the flip-flops that we have been using um, always load in a value on the rising edge of the clock every single clock cycle. Those registers, those flip-flops are going to load in a new value. But we may not always want that to be the case. Uh, it may be such that we only want to import new values to our registers and flip-flops at particular points in time, and that we want to be able to indicate exactly which rising edge of the clock our registers and flip-flops um, read in particular values. So in order to accomplish this, we need to add an additional input to our registers called a load signal that indicates whether or not we want to actually read in a new value to this register or to this flip-flop. Um, so the way that it works is something like this. Uh, here we have a 3-bit load register. You can see it's a 3-bit register because I have 3D flip-flops down here, right? What makes it a load register is this input right here. So I have this additional load signal, right, coming in. And then I have three multiplexers. So what are these multiplexers choosing from? They're choosing from either an input from the outside or they're choosing from the currently stored value, the value that is currently in each of the individual flip-flops. So what are my options? If the load signal is high, then I will read in the outside value and store that in the particular flip-flops. If the load signal is low, then I will just maintain the value that is already existing inside of each of these individual flip-flops. And so what we have then is a register that gives us a little bit more control over when we load that new value in. Um, here is what a block diagram looks like for such a register. You see that it looks very much the same as a regular register, except I have this additional load uh, signal off to the side here. Other than that, it looks uh, very much the same to the registers that we've already been using. One final thing to, to mention, since we are using more and more multi-bit signals, is how to interpret those signals on a timing diagram. We've actually already seen multi-bit signals on timing diagrams back in lab two. Um, so here is an example from a simulation that I took based on the answer to lab two, where you can see I've got multiple bits here in this particular particular signal. So one way that we can represent multiple bits in our timing diagrams is to simply list out all of the bits that are involved. In this particular case, I have three bits here. So I, I have a three-bit signal, and I'm just going to list out all of the bits in the entire signal. Um, for extremely large buses, this is not going to be convenient for us. Imagine, so three bits is not particularly complex, but imagine if it were a 16-bit wide signal or a 32-bit wide signal. Um, all of those ones and zeros would be inconvenient for us. So we have other ways of representing these values in timing circuits. Specifically, we can use hexadecimal. Um, so here is the hexadecimal conversion of that previous timing diagram. We can see now that all of the values are represented by a single number, a single hexadecimal value. Actually, uh, in, in this case, we could have also used decimal values here, since there is no uh, difference between the hexadecimal and decimal conversions of this particular example. But in practice, hexadecimal is going to be more commonly used. Uh, you may see decimal represented in timing diagrams, uh, either signed or unsigned decimal, uh, primarily for arithmetic operations. Uh, but for other kinds of multiple uh, bit signals, such as opcodes and other logical um, control flow kinds of signals, uh, hexadecimal is going to be the primary way that these signals are represented in our timing diagrams.